My name is Nick Carter, and if you guys are here to learn how to run a rabbit farm, you have been misled because you're, you're lo looking at a guy who has never run a successful rabbitry. I had a few cottontails that I rescued from the pine cones uh, under, under the tree when I was a kid and threw in a cage, and believe it or not, they survived until we ate them, uh, fattened them up. I've processed a grand total of three rabbits commercially on the kill floor, and I think I've made like maybe four deliveries personally to, to our customers. So um, has anyone ever seen the movie Office Space? The guy who's the, 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 I'm a people person. Why don't you get this? People ask me all the time with Meet the Rabbit, what do you do? Um, and it's really interesting. What I've done is put together a business around rabbit trees. Um, back in 2011, I decided I'm an entrepreneur. I wanted to start a food-related business. So that was kind of what I wanted to do. Now, to take a step back, I spent 18 years um, farming with my dad before leaving to go uh, to college. So I grew up farming. Dad still farms. I help him in the fall farming. I've got an agricultural background, which is why I wanted to get back into local food as, a, as an entrepreneur. I'd spent about 10 years in uh, high-tech businesses. So I'd started software companies, um, consulting, and wanted to do something more organic, not in the USDA certified sense, but just I wanted to get back into food. And in looking at what opportunities were out there, the idea to start a rabbitry really kind of leapt out to me. It had a lot of, um, a lot of practical benefits. It seemed very attainable. Uh, there was also just some humor behind it. So it, this actually started when I was part of a, a dinner club which was my wife and some of her friends decided that once a quarter we'd get together as couples and we would all prepare dinners together. And the, the, the whole goal of it was to learn different cultural foods and stuff like that. Long story short, we've got a, a friend of ours. They brought us over to their house and we had to uh, work together and we were preparing Persian food. Do you know why there are no Persian restaurants? This stuff was awful. I, I hated it. It was, it was, and I had to be a part of this the whole afternoon, so I said, fine. When it gets time to learn about my culture, y'all are going to learn about how I grew up, and we're going to prepare rabbit together, and they're going to come live. And so I actually, when they came over to our house a few months later, and we were in our backyard, I'm showing them how to process humanely, showing them we, we went from cage to plate, and we enjoyed it. And everyone had fun, and as we were sitting there talking, someone said, well, where can I get this? You know, where can I buy this? And that's really where it started, was the answer is nowhere. We, there was no real commercial availability for rabbit meat. And, I, and being the entrepreneur, one of my friends said, well, why don't you start that business? And I said, sounds like a great idea. And Meet the Rabbit was born. There's, there are, like I said, a lot of good reasons to start rabbit trees. Most of them stemming, if, if, how many of you by show of hands are farmers? I know that's a dumb question. I'm at a farm conference, right? Just thought I'd ask. So you know, yeah, OK. this. That's how I'd say it, you know, in the fall when dad needs me to haul wagons. Um, there's a lot of, from the production side, a lot of benefits to rabbit. High feed conversion ratio, as you know. Inexpensive to raise, easy to raise. A lot, you can convert existing, like, chicken coops and other cages. They're, they're just simple to get into. Also, quick to market. I mean, if you were wanting to get into Wagyu beef, you've got 18 months before you've got a marketable product. With rabbits, you've got 10 weeks. I mean, you can fall over and have rabbits, you know, so... There's a lot of ease in that arena. Um, the problem is, if you wanted to get into Wagyu beef or grass-fed beef or Berkshire pork or free-range chicken, some other kind of value-added agriculture, and to differentiate the income on your farm, there are places that process beef and process pork and process chicken. And you can go there, get on their schedule, and start that company. That was the greatest challenge that we found with rabbits, was that this was not just starting a farm process. We were starting a market. We were developing a new market that did not exist before. So that was the biggest challenge that we had to overcome. Um, if I just started a farm growing rabbits, which I thought about doing and was investigating doing that, I'd have nowhere to sell it. No, first of all, I'd have nowhere to process it. There was nowhere in the state of Indiana where we could process rabbits up until September of 2012, which was our first slaughter. Um, even if I went out and I built a processing facility and I got through state inspection and all of that stuff and zoning, which was a nightmare, 
I would have no market because there weren't a lot of places carrying it currently. Not a lot of people were exposed to it. But at the same time, if I just went out and tried to be a, a rabbit salesman, I had no supply. So we had this whole, it, this whole systemic issue, and starting a whole system is much more difficult than starting one cog of the system. And what we're going to talk about, what I'm mainly going to talk about is profitability. Profitability, profitability, profitability. I mentioned I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a business guy. My degree is in business. My heart's in ag. My degree is in business, and my, my, my brain is in business. And so I knew that when we talk about sustainable ag, it has to be a sustainable business, too. It has to mean profit for a farmer, profit for the processors and the, and the people that are involved in it, profit for the distributors. So we started from the ground up. We figured out how much it would take for a farm to be profitable at this, and we'll talk about that today. We'll talk about the processors, because if you want to start this business for human consumption, you will have to probably sweet talk whoever your, your nearest locker is into devoting you know, one morning to rabbit slaughter. Um, that's going to take some convincing, because they more than likely are not tooled to do it or trained to do it or have any interest to do it. We'll talk about distribution, and we'll talk about, finally, the retail. Okay? So let's start with the farm. Farm profitability. When we set out to start this, what we, we wanted to kind of stack the deck against us, if you will. We didn't want to figure out um, a path to profitability that kind of cut out a lot of the, the middlemen, if you will. I wanted to look at something that would be scalable. In other words, figure out if it could be someday profitable to do rabbit on a larger scale than simply at a, at a farmer's market. Not at all to disparage farmer's markets or direct ag to consumer marketing. That's not my point. What I'm saying is I wanted to find out if, if this was going to scale to where we could, as we are today, uh, distributing rabbit all the way from Nashville to Chicago and everywhere in between um, through larger distribution. And what that boils down to is we had to, at least on paper, because in, in the beginning it was on paper and we were pretending, that we were buying the rabbit this was like we made a rabbit sale barn, you know? We could just, this is what I grew up doing with our freezer beef. Is we would just load up the trailer when they were at market weight and go to the sale barn. We got the market price for them. We had to figure out what's a market price. And the Chicago Board of Trade wasn't helping us. There's, there is no commodity price on rabbits. So that was one of the first things we had to do was determine where, where is this market price going to be if the farmer is, is only in the, the production mode of this? So in other words, they're not going to be taking profit from the ends of distribution and retail. That's not, I'm not saying that's, that's disallowed. That, that actually adds to your margin. But there's also costs in that. But if the farmer were to raise rabbits and sell to us um, as a market, what do they need to earn in order for this to make sense for them? And of course, it's all opportunity cost, right? Because that, that cage space, that barn space could have gone to something else. This has got to make good sense for us. What we found was 339 a pound hanging weight. That's, that's actually still, for the last two years now, that has been our market rate. And the farmer, through efficiencies, has been improving his profitability. Um, and we haven't increased or changed this because, it's, like I said, this isn't trading in Chicago, so it's not as though we've got it tickering up and down anywhere. We just set the price and figured out that this would be profitable. Because of the, the goal of our SARE grant, the stated goal of our SARE grant was to determine if this would be profitable at all three stages. The three stages we identified originally were um, farming, processing, and retail. And we'll talk in a minute. We, we missed a stage in there, the distribution, and then I'll, I'll bring that up. But we, we started out and said, we can't start with this not being profitable for the farmer. So we began the process by going to a farmer and saying who, he was already raising some rabbits. He was doing them um, for farmer's markets, very small scale, and said, if we were to do this on a larger scale, what's your price? So we didn't go to the farmer and say, here's what we're willing to pay. Figure out how to make it work. He set the price. And we said, OK, we'll work with that. Not once did we come back and say, we've got to go lower. So the, uh, he set the price actually at $2 a pound live weight. If you're wondering where this came from, he wanted $2 a pound live weight. The processor that we went to uh, did not have a, a Department of Weights and Measures inspected scale that, would, that they could use for live weight. 
So we averaged out their, their uh, dress percentages, which was about 57 to 59 percent, and came to 339 hanging. Um, this does not include uh, liver and kidneys, um, which can be sold. There's, it, there's a market for that. But this is hanging weight. So, yeah. Well, I say hanging weight because if, you, if anybody has you know, processed beef or, or pork, that's the term used. You don't actually hang these things. This is, this is slop on the table weight. But, right. right. So this is, yes, after the offal's been removed, the fur's been removed, and the head's been removed, this is sellable product. It does make the price calculation easier as you move up the chain, because our cost of goods sold, going into the business terminology or in our accounting, our cost of goods was, was fixed at 339. This incentivized the farmer to bring us mature rabbits too, okay? If they were bringing us uh, rabbits that were over mature uh, or, or under mature, they had not filled out their bone weight, or, sorry, they had not filled out their bone structure yet, they weren't going to make as much. Okay? They wanted to bring us mature rabbits. It actually worked out really, really well. It created a symbiotic relationship where the farmer was incentivized to bring us high yield rabbits. They, if they brought us rabbits that didn't yield well, they didn't get paid as much. Okay? So that's where we started out. If you're wondering in terms of dollars, what to expect, that's where we started with 339 a pound hanging weight or, or dressed weight, what we actually call it. And at that rate, according to the, the grant research that we did, our farmers would break even at 125 fryers a month. They'd break even. If we could move 125 fryers, by the way, how many of you are currently growing rabbits or are familiar, pretty familiar with rabbits, so I'm not going to lose you with words like fryers and broilers or roasters, right? We developed an entirely fryer market. Uh, there's just not much of a market in the U.S. for the uh, roasters or broilers, which are more mature. Uh, also, your feed costs goes way, way higher. The feed conversion ratio that everyone loves about rabbits is true up to about 14 weeks. And then they start burning pellets like it's going out of style just to, to maintain weight. They don't, they don't convert as quickly. So this is all fryers. They break even there. They make profit. Well, sorry, they would they make profit on 126 fryers a month, but they would this would actually be viable for them. What our farmer said, look, the effort that I'd have to put into this, you know, some of the capital expenditure, if I can move 200 fryers a month, I'll do this. Okay? And that netted for him about $4,000 a year in net profit. Net profit. And that's what he was saying, obviously this isn't going to pay the mortgage, but I've got my, I mean, he, he was a, a diversified farm. He's a, a modern diversified farm. He's got specialty crops. He's got Berkshire hogs, actually, he was raising. He's got grass-fed beef. He's got free-range chickens. He now grows for us quail, pheasant. <laughs> Adding this into the mix of his diversified income on the farm, he said, if I can move 200 fryers a month, we'll do it. So that's, that's what we found out. We let the farmer dictate this. The problem is, you don't move 200 fryers a month. The problem is, one month, we may need 100 fryers. One month, we may need, I mean, 300 is low. We had, uh, uh, there's a food convention in Indianapolis called Dig In. Uh, Dig Indiana, it's all local food. They needed 1,000 fryers for this, because it's this huge fair. Luckily, they gave us the order in advance, so we, and we said, these are going to come frozen. <laughs> and so we started building to it. So one of the first challenges that came up was this issue of, the ebb and flow of the demand. And mind you, we had structured the business in such a way that this, this processing entity, Meet the Rabbit, my company, bought from the farmer. So one solution to this, if you are farmers, is that you can go and you can pay the processing. So you've paid for the, the cost of the processing, process the product, bring it back to your farm, have a walk-in or a chest freezer, make sure that it's inspected by the, the appropriate boards of health so that you can store meat there. And you can basically, um, Manage your own expansion, if you will, in the ebbs and flows of the, of the production by storing your product there, having an inventory, selling through that inventory, and, and that's just a, a game of trying to hit the middle. Does that make sense? Um, uh, uh, managing your inventory that way. That's an option. It's not the way we went, but that's a possibility. So you could do frozen storage in that way. Um, one thing I will say about the, the topic of fresh and frozen. I got, when I was doing this, I got on the phone with a lot of people who have done this before, and I, and I got on the phone... Um, nobody, by the way, had done this in my, in my market, so it's not like I was ever talking to a competitor. So 
There's a lot of this going on on the coast. I get on the phone with this guy who uh, had run a rabbit tree in South Carolina. He was very, very gracious to talk with me. Uh, I should have written his name down because to this day I have no idea who it was. I was like dialing numbers off of that I just found on websites and spent probably five or ten minutes with him. And one of the things he said to me in a ten minute conversation, like three times, was get out of the fresh market. He said, run from fresh like it's the plague. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah whatever. But chefs, all the chefs were telling me, we need it fresh. We want fresh. We want fresh. And so I dismissed this advice. And we were having, we had a fresh supply for about the first month. The problem with fresh is, Rabbits do not have the same shelf life that a chicken or pork or anything. I mean, you've got two to four weeks if, you're, if you've got it refrigerated well, the beef. You've got seven days with a rabbit, okay, before they start to smell it. They're not unsafe, but our, our customers were not going to be happy with this. So we were like racing the clock. We'd have a fresh supply for like five days, and then we're moving it into the freezer in order to, to sustain the shelf life. We lost so much product to shrinkage, there was no way to sustain that. And the very interesting thing that happened was, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to hold questions. Please write your question down because of the recording and holding questions at the end. So if you have questions, please write them down, and I will leave time for questions at the end. Uh, what happened was, our customers were saying, we want fresh. It's got to be fresh. It's got to be fresh. We'll only buy it at this time. So we came back and we said, I'm sorry, we're only going to be frozen. And they were like, OK. You know? <laughs> because guess what? There's nobody else selling rabbits in Indiana. So if you want rabbit on your menu, you're buying it frozen, and you're buying it from me. So we ended up and, and uh, skinned our knees there, went to the, the uh, entirely frozen. That was a little deviation. We're talking about how to manage this ebb and flow of, of supply. And so we do freeze all of our product. It helps us on the processing end, being, being the, well, the manufacturer of the food. We freeze our inventory, but we don't, we don't rack up like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of inventory. And so we are still um, varying our kill amounts week to week. Every Friday, our kill floor manager tells our farmer, we, we kill every Monday, we still do, how many to bring. And I mean, it could be 80, it could be 100. Uh, we're doing roughly right now about 600 fryers a month. Okay, That's where we're up to in terms of our distribution. So if, if you're growing rabbits, though, you know this is, again, not like beef. Okay, So if I've got a fat cow, I can keep him probably a couple of months, maybe even longer if I need to. You know, I can, I've got a window of when I can bring him to slaughter if the market's just not quite there yet. With rabbits, you don't have that. Okay? You have a very, very narrow window of time. We'll talk about that in a minute when we talk about the production stuff. But the, uh, what you need is an expansion chamber, and what we found was the, the not-for-human consumption market, otherwise known as meat arena. So if you are going to start a successful rabbitry for human consumption, You've got to find that secondary market for pet food. Talk to uh, local zoos, animal preserves. I mean, there are places around, like Animal Rescue, where these, these like wild, crazy nut people have lions in their backyard. I kid you not, I grew up a mile away from one. Uh, mm -hmm. they got to feed them meat, and they're not shopping for grass-fed beef. So they, they need something that they can feed them economically. That gives you an expansion chamber, and the expansion chamber is pretty easy. Now, they don't pay nearly what we pay. They, they're not going to pay you $2 a pound live weight, okay? They'll pay you about a dollar a pound dress weight. But their dress includes quite a bit more. You can skin to the nose. They'll take head, bone, and all, liver, and kidneys. Okay, so you're going to get, you're going to yield more. You're going to be talking more like 75% of the, of the animal's live weight. And it's, an, and it's an expansion chamber. It's a secondary market. Okay? It's, it's, it's not what you're going to build your primary off of, although you can. But you, it's your secondary market. The other benefit of this, no need for that health inspection like I mentioned. This is on-farm processing. So what happens is you've bred to, you know, roughly you want to try and hit about two or 300 a month in terms of fryers. So you've tried to call that um, steady flow. Well, you know, we go lean for a couple of months, and you're looking at fryers that are getting 13 weeks old. You kill, skin, throw them in a trash bag in a freezer. There's no health requirements for feeding lions or tigers or bears or lions. So you can do that on a farm and manage your own um, herd that way. All right. A couple other tips in terms of the, of the farm that you need to know about. Wean slow, kill fast. Wean slow, kill fast. Um, 
Mind you, this is secondhand from me, so I'm not the guy who's raising our rabbits, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking with them quite a bit. And one of the things I hear a lot that's actually helped the profitability of our two farms that we buy from has been um, they, they wean as slow as possible, actually, because their highest cost input is, guess what? The, the pellets are, are, are rather expensive. So they wean slow, and they kill fast. If a rabbit is 12 weeks old, and we didn't tell them that Friday to bring it the next Monday, they're killing it anyways. Because like I mentioned, the feed conversion ratio rapidly declines after 12 weeks. If you can get your rabbits to market weight at 10 weeks, and so then you know that you've got a four and a half to five and a half pound fryer. That's by the way what we target. Live weight, four and a half to five and a half pounds. That's about where we get our, our best yields based off of what we want. We want at least a, you know, a two and a half to three pound fryer that we're delivering to our customers. And our growers don't want to be feeding these rabbits expensive pellets when their feed conversion ratio is dropping off. So the difference between a five and a half pound fryer and a six or a seven pound fryer is quite a bit of difference in terms of feed cost. Does that all make sense? Okay, so that's where we're targeting. Wean slow, feed the doughs really, really, really well so that you can move the pellets as late as possible. And you'll have to work on that in terms of, of you know, what your herd can manage. Kill fast. There's, you, you can't get attached to these guys. And <laughs> when they're 10, 11 weeks old, you know, You've got to be getting ready that if they're not ready to go to market, eliminate them, dispatch the animal, put it in the freezer, because you can put that in the freezer for the next year until the zoo calls or until the arena contract comes around. Okay. Wean slow, kill fast, make friends with the vet. Your next, your second highest cost for these rabbits is going to be mortality. This was the, the learning lesson that we got. I mentioned our, our grower, and actually we discovered this long after we had submitted our final report for Sayers. So this isn't even in the report. Because we had hit 125, we were approaching where we were doing about 150 to 200 rabbits a month. Uh, by the time we finished all of our research and stuff, we reported back to Sayer. We were doing well, the farmer's making what he said he wanted to be making, or almost there, and we could see that we were going to get there. Everyone was happy, it was going great, we counted it as success, move on. Now we're doing 600 fryers a month, now he's got a whole lot bigger rabbitry. What he didn't know, and we didn't know, is that the difference between raising 200 fryers a month and raising 600 fryers a month in terms of managing that herd and the ability that disease has to ravage your inventory is pretty high. Mainly respiratory distress, mainly in these months. Okay, You can't get quite the airflow in your barns. Um, you got to keep water heated and things like that. So as you are developing this, Find, I mean, talk to your local veterinarian. I'm certain that if you're raising livestock right now, you've got a relationship with a vet. Find out if they know anything about rabbits. And if they don't, buy the guy a book. Okay, because you are going to want somebody who can help you. Uh, when you see a sniffle, move. Uh, don't, don't wait until one dies or anything like that, because these things can, can completely take over your herd. Um, another reason for the pet food contract. You've got an eight-week-old prior. That sneezes, grab a, grab a hatchet, okay? Put it in the freezer, get it out of your herd. Um, those are some of the lessons learned. Next thing, if you're wondering, one of the things that comes up is breed. What breed do we raise? And, and this is all I've learned, is that everybody who, who knows the answer to that question is certain that they've got the right answer and everyone's got a different answer. I've seen Champagne to Argents, I've seen Satins, I've seen Altex, I've seen New Zealand's, Californians, it's all across the board, and we originally said we will only buy Californians and New Zealands. That was our, our that's, I mean, that's a standard meat rabbit, that's a meat pen, that's, that's your, your basic. And they are, great feed conversion ratio, great long loins, uh, it, it's, it's just a great animal, okay? Uh, eventually, we learned that really what matters is not so much the breed, although, I mean, we don't want to be buying Flemish Giants or something like that. So, within reason, but what really matters is white which means no Zealand, no Zealand reds, we don't buy brokens. If there's black fur on it, we're not buying it. This is our requirement now. And here's why. How many of you have processed rabbits? And I don't mean cocktail, okay? Yeah, all right. So you know that um, the fur 
goes everywhere. I mean, a lot of our standard operating procedures, our SOP for the rapid processing, has to do with management of fur. Okay, it's like dunk in water first, and then we've got water there, and it's because that stuff goes everywhere. And so we do everything that we possibly can to keep the fur from making it onto the finished product, but guess what? We won't succeed 100%. And white fur on white meat is invisible. Okay? Black fur on white meat is a return product from a very angry cow. There's hair in my food! Well, there was hair in the other food too, but you just didn't see it. And when you threw it on the grill, it got all burned up. That's why. And it sounds very silly, but that's the, that's a very important thing to do. However, I mean, if you if you farmed rabbits, you know that your 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 genetic, you're gonna get broken. You're gonna get it broken. Again, secondary market. Got to have a secondary market because for human consumption, if you're smart, you're not going to sell those broken um, unless I mean we've made some exceptions. You know we've got like some spots in your paws or something like that, and the paws come off early in the process, anyways. But by and large, you do not want color in the fur. Okay, satins have a uh, satin colors are little colors, but but that's okay. A champagne color is okay. You do not want a black or a red. Second thing regarding farming. So I mentioned the breed, even though everyone thinks that the breed is really, really important, not quite as important as the color. We have a running joke, and, and um, I got in trouble because I actually said this to a reporter one time, and it, it went in print. That's how the press works, guys. Uh, somebody asked me if they were free range, and I said, you know what we call free range rabbit? No, they're not free range rabbits. These things, I mean, you can't. You can't do that. Now there are some models, I've read about them, I've not used them, and none of our farmers have used them, where you're basically, they're, in, they're small moving hutches. You guys know what I'm talking about? So you're essentially grazing those rabbits. High labor input, you've got to keep them covered though. They have no way to defend themselves. And they will die from fear too. So even if you have them well covered, but the coyote is right outside that, that cage, that rabbit's going to die. The whole, and, and you don't have one in a cage, you usually cage them by uh, litters, so you get six or seven kits together. So it's too costly to do that. It's also very labor intensive to move these, rotate these things around and then get fresh grass. And you know what I found was a whole lot easier? Is just cutting the grass and bringing that to the rabbit. So if you really want grass fed and you want to have that kind of uh, natural foliage going into the rabbit's diet, which we recommend, it's a really good idea. Adding the roughage, it helps the rabbit to modify its own diet for what it needs for its own health. Great idea, cut the grass and bring it to it. Don't bring the rabbit. The second side of this is that everyone pictures free range having this meaning that it's this happy animal, you know, roaming around the countryside. Except rabbits are, they have agoraphobia. They don't like wide open spaces. They're not like chickens and cows and pigs where they're like, ooh, wide open spaces. If you put a rabbit in this room and you're like, here you go, room to run, you will find him in three minutes in the smallest corner with his head down, buried into a little cubby. That's where they want to be. Okay, so. We use larger than normal cages. We don't overpopulate the cages. Um, I mean, I don't want to be dismissive of the humane treatment of our animals. We are very humane the way we treat our animals. But it's, it's a difficult thing to educate the consumers that humane doesn't just mean turning them loose on the countryside. When you're talking about an animal that likes to live in a, I mean, if you held a pet rabbit, it crawls up your sleeve and puts its head down in here and then you took rabbit and forage, right? They want to be in a cage. They're not, they're not upset by this. Um, as long as they're not overpopulated, as long as you, um, on our farm anyway, we found that we cage uh, kids of a litter, okay, so we don't intermix litters. They will destroy each other if you do. Um, and we had, we had one grower that we started buying from one time. Uh, his animals started showing up and a lot of them would have ears completely missing. We stopped buying from them. We were, we're like, we're not gonna buy your animals anymore. We know how you're caging them. You're overpopulating them. You're mixing litters. They, they gnaw each other's ears off. Um, so we stop buying from that part. So don't get all cracked up about the production model of free range when it comes to rabbits. Um, all right, let's talk about the second stage in this. It has got to be profitable for this to make any sense whatsoever, and that's processing. How many of you know of an inspected processing facility that will slaughter rabbits? No. Yeah? Yeah, in Ohio? Yeah. yeah, good. There are a few. I've got, I've got my slides out of order, but I've got a list of the ones in the state of Ohio that will do it. Okay. Um, 
if one of them is not nearby, we can talk about this. Because in Indiana, Meet the Rabbit on uh, September 4th, 2012, conducted the first ever state inspected <coughs> rabbit slaughter in Indiana. Okay. Previously, there had been a USDA plant up in northern Indiana that had done some rabbit under USDA's um, inspection. They no longer do it because the USDA has made it harder and harder and harder to do this to the degree that they were requiring a separate kill floor for any game than for uh, non-game. If you're not familiar with why this is such a problem, it's because the USDA's body of regulations, essentially, they got too specific. When they said, instead of saying, we're going to require inspection for meat, they said, we're going to require inspection for, and listed what they defined as meat. Rabbit didn't make the cut. This was back in the 70s when this was being drafted. And nobody thought much of it at the time, because nobody was eating really, really exotic meats and stuff like that. It just didn't matter. Well, then what happens when states start to build their own state um, regulations and, and board of health and stuff like that? They go to the USDA, they copy, they paste, they go into Word, find, replace USDA with Board of Animal Health Indiana. And that's it. Boom! we have got a Board of Animal Health regulation. So they copy and paste, and you find this everywhere. It's called a non-amenable species. That's the problem. The regulations are silent on it, on the inspection side. Then you go over to what's called, in Indiana anyways, is the, the retail food, um, now I'm going to miss it, it's the, it's the re retail food code or something like that. And I'm certain you've got the same thing in Ohio, you've got this everywhere, which says, in order to sell meat to the public, it has to be inspected. So you've got the Board of Animal Health that says, we don't, rabbit's not meat, I don't know what you're talking about. And you've got retail board of, or the retail code that says, you have to have it inspected. This was a problem. And so, uh, in the state of Indiana, we were able to work with our state board of health and show them that uh, we can pay an extra fee. So we have to pay $24 an hour to have the processor there. We have to pay extra to have the processor on the floor, and they will inspect these rabbits under state inspection, give us the state seal, and now we're good to go. Now, you heard me mention earlier that we um, distribute now from Chicago to Nashville. What's the big deal with if you're doing beef, right? Why do you want to go to a USDA plant over a state inspected plant? Cross state lines. Cross state lines. Guess what? When the USDA said we don't think rabbit is meat, they said that that regulation doesn't apply to rabbit as well. So what that means is, with a state seal, we can go wherever we want to. Uh, this is the point at which I would like to tell you I am not an attorney, <laughs> and this should not be construed as legal advice, uh, but. If you research it yourself, you'll find out that that's, that's pretty much, that's the loophole you get to, to follow through. USDA also charges an inspection fee on non-amenable species. So when a USDA plant does do rabbit or elk or anything that's non-amenable species, which, you know, if you bribe your inspector, they will, I didn't say that out loud. If you really sweet talk your inspector, they'll finally let you do it, even though they'll tell you that you're not allowed to. You are. But it's, I believe, $55 an hour for the special inspection fees. Your state level is usually less expensive. Ours in Indiana was $24 an hour. So we're able to cut costs. $20 an hour here. Thank you. $20 an hour in Ohio. I'm moving my business. My profitability is <laughs> So you've got a, a lower cost of inspection, and yet you can now sell this across state lines, provided there's reciprocity with those states, okay? Which we checked. I mean, so that was one of the first calls. We call Illinois Board of Animal Health. Hey, we've got an Indiana insignia. Can we sell it? Yeah, that's fine. So it, Get reciprocity. That was actually rather easy. You can go across state lines. Um, so I would recommend looking at state inspected facilities. Your costs are going to be lower. You're going to find somebody um, that's more. If, if they're not already doing rabbits, they're more apt to be interested in, a, in another avenue for revenue like this. Mainly because how many of you know a state inspected locker plant or, or kill floor that has closed in the last ten years? I mean, there it's a hard business to stay competitive in. You know why? Because they can't sell their product across state lines. So they're looking for other ways to do revenue. Now, that doesn't mean that they're eager to change and get new equipment and get new stuff. You have to convince them of this. This was probably the hardest part of my business. I did not realize it would be. But finding the processing turned out to be an incredibly difficult part of the business. And luckily, uh, I was about to be done when I met Adam Moody, who owns uh, Moody Meats, Moody's Butcher Shops. He has his own state inspected facility. And I contacted him and said, do you want to do rabbits? And this is what happened. You'll probably hear this too, if you're going to try and talk somebody into getting rabbits that isn't currently doing it. 
no, you know, people ask us about that all the time, but it's just not worth the time. And I said, and I wrote back and I said, well, we're planning on doing 600 a month. My phone rang. Because they're used to hearing from somebody who just got back from a hunting trip with their nephew and they've got four cottontails in the bag. Um, or something like that. Or somebody's like, well, I've got five or ten rabbits that I want to sell at a farmer's market. And it is not worth an inspector's time to do that. It's usually state minimums in Indiana. They're only going to go for two hours minimum, so there's $48 minimum on inspection, so if you're only going to spend 10 minutes, just... And then, according to HACCP plans, you have to sanitize, then start doing the work, then sanitize again before you move to anything else, so it just doesn't make sense. It was the volume that made it make sense. That was the biggest um, part of this. We had to have promise the volume to the processor for it to make sense for him. Um, here's, where, here's where we're at on price. Our processor, which, which is actually me in partnership with the the, that's, that's the level where my business is at, if you will. Meet the rabbit buys from the farms, and then we, we send it upstream into the, the food supply chain. So we, as a processor, mark up the wholesale about two dollars a pound. So we pay, I mentioned earlier, three thirty nine a pound, dress weight, and like I said, it makes it really easy for our cost of goods. Our cost of goods is three thirty nine a pound. We pay that to the grower. After having processed, we get the, the total dress weight for that day. We send them a check. We sell it for five thirty nine a pound wholesale. Okay, so we, we tack $2 on it. If you work that math, it's about six bucks a head. Compare that to chickens and you know the usual kill fees for poultry, and it's pretty high. We've had people really balk at that. Number one, this includes a special inspection fee. Okay? Number two, if I'm doing chickens, I usually do it all day. I have one set up in the morning, one clean up in the evening. I'm doing rabbits, I mean, we can do a rabbit a minute. So if you want some stats to go talk to a four, a team of four, four person team on the kill floor, can do a rabbit a minute. Okay? 60 rabbits an hour, we're done with our kill in two hours or less. We've had to start adding quail and pheasant just to get, make use of that minimum um, 22 hour inspection time. So, yeah, it's expensive. Uh, the, the nice part for us is it's not a price competitive market. I mean, it's, like, like I mentioned about the fresh thing, when, the, when our customers were like, we wanted it fresh, but we can't buy it anywhere else. You know? So if we were to, to needle on this, we're getting all of it down to $5.50 or $4.50, and it makes like a 40 or 30 cent blip on our actual wholesale price. It's not, gonna, it's not that price sensitive of a market. Respect what your processors have in this, the risk that they have in this, that they're next on the line, if this new meat that they've never seen before makes somebody sick, that's, that's them, not you as a farmer, okay? So respect what they've got on the line, whatever they tell you it's gonna cost, it'll cost, it probably will be expensive, just trying to prepare you for that. But they're, they need to clear uh, quite a bit for their kill floor too. Also think about their opportunity cost. I mean, like, like I said, a four person team does 60 rabbits in, a, in an hour, so that's about 360 bucks, you know, minus all their costs. But their, their alternative is, I mean, I buy beef off the rail, you know, so I know it's a $125 kill fee. So they can make three sixty dollars in an hour with a four-person team, and they can walk out there with a $22, $125. Boom, drop a steer, there's $125. Bucks. Much easier to make money on some of the larger animals, and so we've got to really make this make sense for the processor to allocate that kill floor to a different animal. Um, yeah, here we go. You guys, I did not do handouts, and I apologize. So uh, I'm going to read these off if you want to know. I have no idea where these are. Not familiar with Ohio. I'm from Indiana. It's on the out-of-towner. Hickory Hills Meats, Old Village Meats, Stalin's Meats, Ebel's Butcher Shop, Dick's Packing, and Pleasant Valley Poultry. Um, I'm assuming you guys, if you recognize one of these, then you'll know where they are. And if you don't recognize those names, they're probably nowhere near you. By the way, I'm not guaranteeing that these guys are in the business of this. This came from the uh, Ohio State Board of Health. It's not called BOA in Ohio. What's it called? Meat and Poultry Inspection. We call it BOA over in Indiana. The, the Ohio Board of Animal Health and Inspection uh, Division. I emailed them in advance of this presentation and asked if they had anybody under state inspection that, had, uh, that was ins inspected to do rabbit. In Indiana, nobody ever was. Ohio, you're already ahead of the game. You've got six of them. All this means, though, is that on the books, they legally can. They've already passed inspection for it. 
like I said, I'm not guaranteeing that they are currently in the business, but they could. These Pleasant guys. Pleasant Valley Dibs. Thank you. To a, Thank you. Where is Pleasant Valley? Sugar Dibs? Creek. Sugar Creek. North Central, East Central Ohio. But like I mentioned, if, if you are near somewhere that does not that is not one of these, it's not impossible for a state inspected plant to get there. Okay, and we'd be willing to help, mind you. We may have a HACCP plan, we have SOPs uh, that are already prepared, because that's the biggest challenge. Is, is, and what do we do? So you, if you go to try and help your local butcher into doing this, they're going to have resistance, and you're going to need to know how to talk them into it. One is, it's going to be profitable. Say, look, I'll, I'll pay you six bucks a head. You can clear this amount of money. Second is, I'll help you get there. You know, we can get asset plans and stuff like that that aren't that hard to develop. Third is, the costs of equipment are pretty low. We spent about $1,000 total on, on, a, on new equipment in an existing facility. Um, and that was something called the Rabbit Ringer. If you're not, found it on YouTube. This guy built it for backyard butchering, and it is, I mean, he's, a, he's like a freelance welder or whatever, I don't know, and he, just, he makes these things in his garage. You can buy them for $200 online, he'll ship them to you in about six weeks. And they're great. I mean, they really are great. We use them for the dispatching, and uh, they're basically a little tiny abatross that, that you can hang them up on to this process. It works really, really well. And then we, we got some special shears that, that sheared off the hind quarters cleanly to make that bone cut clean at the hind hop, because that's actually very important for plate presentation when you're selling the chef. Um, okay. Real quickly, the next thing we had to do was to get the retailers profitable. This became a challenge. We had to quickly pivot to what we call in the, in the business world. The fancy word is pivot. The real word is call an audible. If that didn't work, let's change the plan. Because originally, we went to all the grocery stores and butcher shops. If, that's where you're, if you're thinking human consumption, that's where a lot of people think first. I'm going to get my rabbit at the grocery store or at the butcher shop. What we discovered is that to us, eating rabbit is not weird. To them, this is weird. Okay, That's what we discovered. And weird means I want a chef to do it for me. How many of you have ever eaten calamari? How many of you ever cooked calamari in your own kitchen? Okay, exactly, right? Rabbit's in the same category. People will order it on a menu. Oh, that's bizarre. That's unique. I have not seen that before. I wonder what that tastes like. I'll order that. Nobody's going down the grocery aisle. That doesn't happen. So we had to quickly change our market, and what, what we ended up with is food service. The culinary, I mean, there's a, as, as simultaneous to the local food movement is the culinary movement. People are becoming foodies, okay? All these millennials out there looking for purpose in life, like chefs for whatever reason. Um, I can say that because I'm technically a millennial, but I do not identify with that way. But it's a developing um, industry. In Indianapolis, we're actually behind the time. Cincinnati is a very, very uh, epicurious kind of a culture. Uh, there's more around. So we discovered our customers were going to be chefs. They're going to be chefs. We sell, uh, I'd say, about 90% of our, our fryers go into food service. 90% of our fryers go into food service, um, which means when you're going out marketing, it actually makes it a little easier to sell because one chef represents the buying power of maybe 50 diners or so. Okay? So, so it's a wholesale thing. Um, last and real quickly, I mentioned the three prongs that we had tackled in our, our sales ramp. The one that we had forgotten was distributor. We talked about farm, processor, retailer. I kind of just overlooked the fact that I don't like driving to Nashville on a weekly basis with a truckload of dead rabbits. So we had to find a distributor. So, and they're out there. More, they're easily accessible in the food service business than they are in the retail grocery business. Retail grocery, as I'm discovering with another company that we've recently started, where we sell frozen foods in grocery stores, that's a tough business. Food service is a little easier to get into. There are existing regional food service distributors uh, that you can find. They have fleets already on the road. Uh, so they have existing customers, fleets on the road. It, it makes perfect sense for them. They're already stopping at you know, Chef XYZ's kitchen to sell him his tomatoes and his salt and his napkins. I mean, these guys sell, they're called broadliners sometimes. They sell anything that can be used in a restaurant. 
why not also drop off a case of rent? Okay. So we found that relationship was pretty easy to develop. It's going to be an important relationship if you want to scale the business, because otherwise you're doing a lot of the deliveries. It's not outside the realm of possibility, but because of the scale we were going for, Chicago to Nashville, we had to assign distributors. So that's really where it, um, it started. It also made the accounting really easy, because the one thing about chefs is they, you can sell to the chefs, and instead of selling to 50 consumers, you sell to one chef. These guys are terrible at accounting. Okay? They go late on their invoices all the time. Do COD if you're going to sell distributors. We go through distributors, that's their problem, we have one invoice. Okay? But it simplified billing. All right, where do we start? If you're going to start and you want to do this on your farm, I'm going to tell you don't start by getting your breed stock, don't start by this or that. Start by talking to your market. Find your secondary market, find uh, animal rescue shelters, find zoos, figure out if you can get a contract with Purina or be a supplier to a pet, some pet food, food company, aggregator basically, and then start talking to restaurateurs, start talking to the, the catering people at uh, universities, especially private universities. They run a lot of alumni banquets and things like that, and those guys want to be uh, treated well. They want exotic foods. They've actually been a very good customer of ours. Talk to the food service distributors. Develop a market first. Because i got to tell you, when you go to a processor and you say, I want you to retool and, and develop a new SOP and start a new livestock in here and deal with the Board of Animal Health and get a new inspection process going, if you can say, because I already have customers ready to buy this, that helps. Quite a bit. Uh, and then, finally, and I, I, I don't mean to, I hope this doesn't sound insulting, but the growing of them is actually the easy part. I mean, they breed like rabbits. Uh, so the develop, once you have a, a or sorry, once you have demand and processing, you can have supply ready to go in about 90 days. Because, what is it, 30-day gestation, 10 weeks to market. Okay. All right, questions? Yeah, so the grower that we buy from, that grows for us, as I, I kind of alluded to, his whole, his farm is a very differentiated farm because they are at farmer's market. It's actually, it's called Eli Creek Farm. They're in Connersville. They're in some of the Cincinnati markets as well because they're so close to Ohio. They're right on the Ohio-Indiana border. Uh, the farmer's name is John Godard. And so what, what he does is, that's a really good point. We talked about the ebb and flow of our supply or of our demand. So if we tell him on some Friday, hey, on, on Monday, we only need 40, you know, which is kind of hardly worth his trip to the plant, okay? And he'll say, that's fine, I'm gonna kill, I'm gonna kill 80 then. And I'm gonna take 40 back to my supply, because he's in farmer's markets. So now he's got three outlets, okay, as a farm. He's got farmer's markets, he's got us, he's got pet foods. When you can start differentiating all of your outlets, that's when you can really manage a herd well and not have to constantly be slowing down your breeding to try and, and react to a market 12 weeks from now. Okay, that makes sense? So keep steady breeding going. Good question. Ma'am, over here, you had a question earlier and I cut you off. Did, did I answer it already? Or? Uh, no, I was going to ask you if um, the shelf life for fresh rabbits was seven days backpacks or just like a regular That's the regular? That was uh, poly and paper. So that was poly and paper, not backpack. Okay. Um, we, we do just the poly and paper instead of the back because the backpacking, is difficult with the bones, the bones on the hindquarters. Uh, chefs, like I said, are our main customer. One of the big things that, that's important to chefs is plate presentation. Not just the taste, but they want plate presentation. So they'll a lot of times put these up almost like a rack of land where they've got that bone sticking up out of the hindquarter. That's why it's very that's why we had to invest in a special shear that would cut that bone clean. We didn't have bone fragments or shards coming off of it, it wasn't a broken bone. And I mean, and to get a bone saw. This is kind of ridiculous. So um, they're hard to backpack because of those bones. Good question. Yeah. I guess I was kind of surprised by the 12 week so much, or just because sort of our rabbits, I was going to say that they just don't seem mature at that age. They don't seem to mature until almost about 16. And I'm reading. What's your life weight at 12 months? Um, not sure about life, but fully drafted, only in the sense that they're four pounds. You're going a little long. Okay. 
your fee conversion is probably trailing off there in the last four weeks. You might also want to look at what kind of feed you're using to, um, in terms of walking them off. Um, and I'm not the right person to do that, but I will, if you email me, I can. The farmer that, that we buy from is very, very helpful and he'd be glad to share what, what kind of a mix he uses. Um, but we actually, um, some of ours are 10 weeks. They're five and a half pound live weight, they dress it out around three pounds at 10 weeks. And that's, a, that's an Altex. Altex breed, very expensive genetics. If you want to know my favorite, it's Altex. That's, the, that's our best breed. Expensive genetics, very fast to market, awesome loins, white. Uh, it was developed in the University of Alabama in Texas. What is Altex? A-L-T-E-X. Just Google Altex rabbits. They're a, they're a now stable hybrid, if that makes sense. They've been, they've been developed. Uh, you mentioned no colored fur. Does that mean you're no longer accepting Californian stock, or do they qualify as a white rabbit? They're qualified as a white rabbit. Okay. That's it. It's all on the head. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Two minutes. Okay. Other questions? Has anyone out there asked you for hair-free rabbits? No. Um, right now, this is such a new market. There's no, there's not really differentiation other than local versus not local. So there's, it's not so specialized as like the beef market or the pork market where it's a ubiquitous product and now you're going to differentiate based on breed. Our big differentiation is that these rabbits are three pounds dressed, not the Chinese rabbits that are about a pound and a half dressed. And if you want to know why that is, it's because Chinese rabbits are grown for fur first Meat's a byproduct. You've got most of your surface area at eight weeks. You get your meat underneath that fur in the last four. They kill them at eight, take the fur, eh, we'll sell this pound and a half rat, not developed thing and ship it on container ships over the US. Yeah. What do you do with your pelts? Great question. Secondary market for pelts, very, very difficult to do. Reason being, you gotta keep them in a refrigerated barn in order to get them to bulk up their fur, very costly. We actually don't sell our pelts. Our pelts go to compost. Yeah, yeah. In order to get the right kind of a pelt, you've got to keep them in a refrigerated barn. Other questions? Yeah, like thirty seconds. Yeah. So for the breaking point on the beans, two hundred to three hundred rabbits. It doesn't make sense to have. Is, is it hard to get people to keep their operation small and then get the rabbits to come to you to have more people raising your rabbits? Or do they just have to get paid because you don't have enough people who will raise your rabbits? It was easier for, uh, we have one primary farmer that we go to. I mean, he's, he's like the top of the chain. And if he can't, for whatever reason, supply us that week, we've got a few backups. Uh, the reason is because of all these secondary markets that have to exist. We didn't aggregate those secondary markets, so we, we were only one of them. And so for one farmer, it's a lot of work for him to develop the, a contract with Purina and, and to have a good presence in farmer's markets. So it just doubles that effort when you have to have a second farmer who's able to do that and a third farmer and so on. Our, our secondary farmers are actually growing for show. It's, it's a satin, purebred, pedigree. And they give us the ones that wouldn't show well. But I mean, if I were to buy them as show rabbits, they would be $100. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.